who don't mind the idea. And New Zealand's Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern is holding another of her news conferences in Wellington. Let's just listen in to what she has to say. Welcome, everyone. On 15 March, the nation witnessed a terrorist attack that demonstrated the weakness of New Zealand's gun laws. New Zealand's regulation of arms primarily dates back to 1983. Sadly, since that time, the most substantive changes to our laws came following the Aramoana shootings. Those changes, however, did not go far enough. Successive attempts have been made and failed to change our laws since then. Those attempts were in 1999, 2005, 2012, and more recently through a select committee inquiry in early 2017. And still, none of the changes that have been made in the past dealt with one of the most glaring issues we have that sets New Zealand apart from many other nations, the availability of military-style semi-automatic weapons. The attacker on 15 March took a significant number of lives using primarily two guns. They were assault rifles and they were purchased legally on an A-category gun licence, the standard licence held by gun owners in New Zealand. The capacity of these assault rifles was then enhanced using 30 plus round magazines, essentially turning them into military style semi-automatic weapons. While the modification of these guns was illegal, it was done easily through a simple online purchase. The guns used in this terrorist attack had important distinguishing features. First, their capacity and also their delivery. They had the power to shoot continuously, but they also had large capacity magazines. I absolutely believe there will be a common view amongst New Zealanders, those who use guns for legitimate purposes, and those who have never touched one, that the time for the mass and easy availability of these weapons must end. And today, they will. Today I'm announcing that New Zealand will ban all military-style semi-automatic weapons. We will also ban all assault rifles. We will ban all high-capacity magazines. We will ban all parts with the ability to convert semi-automatic or any other type of firearm into a military-style semi-automatic weapon. We will ban parts that cause a firearm to generate semi-automatic, automatic or close to automatic gunfire. In short, every semi-automatic weapon used in the terrorist attack on Friday will be banned in this country. These changes will require legislation. That legislation is now being drafted and will be introduced under urgency. A shortened select committee process will apply, so I encourage all those who wish to submit to start now. My expectation is that the law will be in place by the end of the next two-week sitting session, which is by the 11th of April. As a government, however, we did not wish to allow a situation where irresponsible dealers continue to sell weapons that will be banned within a few weeks. That is why we have taken an interim measure. As at 3 p.m. today, an order in council took effect. These changes to our regulations will ensure virtually all of the weapons I have announced as being banned will be categorized as weapons that require an E-class endorsement. The effect of this will mean that no one will be able to buy these weapons without a permit to procure from the police. I can assure people that there is no point in applying for such a permit. This is an interim measure to ensure the trade of these weapons ceases from 3 p.m. today. As a government, we acknowledge that there will be gun owners who have legitimately purchased weapons we have now moved to ban. 
Some, for instance, will use them for large-scale culling, such as dock. We will, as a Cabinet, work through legalised exemptions for these purposes, but they will be tightly regulated. For others, these guns will now come out of circulation. I acknowledge and thank those retailers who have voluntarily ceased to sell military-style semi-automatic and assault rifles. You will have seen the collective issues we face as a country and reacted swiftly, and I thank you for that. For other dealers, sales should essentially now cease. My expectation is that these weapons will be returned to your suppliers and never enter into the New Zealand market again. For current owners of the weapons we have moved to ban, I acknowledge that many of you will have acted within the law. In recognition of that, and to incentivise their return, we will be establishing a buyback scheme. The details of this scheme are being developed in parallel to the drafting of the legislation to enforce the ban. In the meantime, we are asking all current holders of military-style semi-automatic weapons and assault rifles to visit www.police.govt.nz. There they will find details of the weapons included in this ban. In the next 48 hours, a form will be available on this site that we are asking these gun owners to complete, identifying what banned guns they hold. The police will then arrange for these weapons to be handed over and eventually destroyed. Details of the weapons handed back by owners that are covered by the ban will also be taken to ensure that fair and reasonable compensation is paid once the buyback is in place. If owners are unable to complete the online form, they are able to contact the police on the phone to arrange the handover of these now banned guns. I do want to emphasise, to manage the flow of information to the police online is the best way to arrange the return of your weapons. Do not arrive at the police station unannounced with these weapons in your possession. As the legislation is developed, we will determine the time available for the return of military-style semi-automatic weapons and assault rifles, and the duration of the buyback scheme. I can ensure people that there will be time for the returns to be made, and that they will not be criminalised overnight. After a reasonable period for returns, those who continue to possess these guns will be in contravention of the law. Currently, the penalties for this range from fines of up to $4,000 and or three years in prison. The draft legislation will look to increase these penalties. I want to acknowledge that the weapons available in New Zealand are only part of the problem, and loopholes with our current law continue to exist. On Monday, Cabinet will receive and consider further amendment to our gun laws. These proposals will, however, go through a more fulsome process. But be assured, this is just the beginning of the work we need to do. Finally, I want to repeat a message I have consistently shared since announcing our laws would change. We do have guns in New Zealand that are used for legitimate purposes by responsible owners every single day. And that includes our rural community. They manage pests, they use for animal welfare and also for recreation. I've been steadfast in my belief that the vast majority of these owners will support what we are doing here today because it's about all of us. It's in the national interest and it's about safety. I will work hard to retain that support as we work on the remaining tranches of reform that we must make to prevent an act of terror happening in our country ever again. I'll now hand over to the Minister of Police. Thank you, Prime Minister. Two hours ago, I was amongst a group of ministers who signed off on the order which tightens the law on the sale of assault rifles. It is an interim step until legislation can be introduced and passed to ban all military-style semi-automatics. These measures will make a real difference to enable New Zealand to become a safer place. As the Prime Minister has, always say, has already said, the time to act is now. The order, which is now in effect, will discourage the potential stockpiling of these assault rifles and encourage people to continue to surrender their firearms. 
Dozens of firearm owners have come forward so far, and I expect more will do so. Police are gearing up to enable these weapons to be taken out of circulation. They'll be supported by the New Zealand Defence Force to enable safe storage, transport and destruction of assault rifles and MSSAs. As the Prime Minister has also alluded to, police are definitely encouraging firearms owners to go to the police website and use the online form to arrange to hand over the MSSAs and assault rifles. Finally, I want to remind that it is a privilege and not a right to own a firearm in New Zealand. We know that there are many gun owners with legitimate reasons for owning firearms, especially in our rural and provincial communities. This work is not directed at them. Our focus is on ensuring the immediate safety and peace of mind of our communities. Prime Minister, does the government have any idea of how much this buyback is going to be? Uh, the answer, in short, is uh, not with any certainty. Uh, uh, one of the failings of our system, of course, means that we can have uh, a range of weapons uh, that are of this uh, power and calibre and simply not know how many there are. Uh, the estimate that is being made for, by officials is that the buyback could cost anywhere between $100 million and $200 million. Uh, but that is the price that we must pay to ensure the safety of our communities. Well, essentially, the effect of this legislation will close that gap between Australia and New Zealand. Australia had an exemption that allowed, for instance, farmers uh, to seek uh, permits to continue to use uh, weapons like 22 for legitimate use. In fact, in New South Wales, there are 16,000 farmers who are able to use those kinds of guns. We've essentially achieved the same outcome, but by looking at those specific weapons that are used for legitimate use by farmers, but are not designed to undertake the kind of horror and attack that we saw on Friday. Why not just have a permitting structure like Australia? Essentially, as I say, achieves a very similar outcome. Uh, they've used a permitting process. Um, we've instead designated those guns which uh, have been determined and on the advice of the police and not the guns that are needed to be targeted. There is legitimate use in our rural community, things like killing possums, uh, animal welfare issues. We've targeted here the guns that are actually doing the harm in our community and we saw that on Friday. Well, what we are banning today are the things that were used in last Friday's attack. Why has it taken so long, why has it taken so long, Prime Minister, for the politicians to react? This debate has been going on now for 25 years. Yeah, and there have been repeat attempts, uh, and that's clear in some of the dates that I've shared with you. Uh, but though I think what's important now is that New Zealand public is galvanised, and I would hope that politicians are galvanised behind these changes. In, in the second, um, yeah, as I've, um, as I've said, uh, what we've done here are taken out the guns out of circulation uh, that are, are most critical to be addressed urgently. Uh, and that's what we've announced uh, with essentially almost immediate effect. There is more to be done. In tranche two, we'll look at issues around licensing, uh, issues around registration, issues around storage. Uh, there are a range of other amendments that we believe do need to be made, and that will be the second tranche of reforms yet to come. So a gun register is on the horizon. Issues around registration we will look at. Cabinet will receive a paper on Monday. I expect decisions to be made from there. I will be looking really directly to police, though, around the things that will make the biggest difference to them uh, in, uh, in their minds, and we'll look at some of the international evidence as well. We are really trying to target here uh, those who uh, seek firearms for illegitimate use, seek them for crime and to cause harm, whilst of course acknowledging that particularly in our rural communities, we do have legitimate use. <laughs> Sorry, what was that? What, what I would, my advice to them is that you're wasting your time. Why not 
we're what we're essentially doing is removing uh, the ammunition that is used and the weapons that we simply should not be allowing access to in New Zealand or should not be allowing access to in order to modify any other gun. I'll allow the Minister of Police to add to that. Yeah, it's dead right. The other thing is the Prime Minister alluded to, there's a second tranche of advice we're getting from the police, which is coming to Cabinet on Monday. Uh, mm -hmm. It will talk about uh, what we do with regard to ammunition. So keeping in mind the two issues that we face in New Zealand is both the availability of guns mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, at, for those who hold an A uh, licence, but also the ease of which you can modify those guns. Mm -hmm. So we're taking out of circulation both the guns that can be modified in that way uh, easily mm -hmm. uh, and that are designed to essentially take lives, uh, as well as uh, the magazines that allow that easy modification. Australia saw an increase in the theft of firearms during the buyback period. The, in the Australia saw an increase in the theft of firearms right. during the buyback period, with people stealing them and then basically handing them in for mm. money. Is that something New Zealand's expecting? Yeah, look, of course we're looking across at the experience of Australia and trying to learn from the process that they've gone through. What we hope with um, the buyback, of course, is that you stop uh, a black market emerging around them by paying a fair and reasonable price that incentivises people to bring them in uh, to the police rather than seeking another, another way in which to sell. Uh, of course, uh, when it comes to uh, wider issues of theft, we'll do what we can uh, uh, to prevent that. Uh, of course, what we are looking to do is increase the penalty for those who will continue to uh, have possession of these weapons by the time uh, that the full ban has taken uh, force and the period for buybacks uh, is over. So those penalties will go up. Uh, and of course, it's an operational matter for police as how they choose to police that. But I imagine that will be one of the things on their mind. Excuse me, Prime Minister. If I could, if I could just ahead. add to that, the, the police do have the ability to go into any licensed dealer and mm. ask for records. Mm. They will be doing that and check them off against those who have bought these types of weapons. Do you have any idea how many assaults by the discretion when it comes to criminals handing back their weapons that may not be the licensed owner of them? Yeah, so um, the uh, police, of course, um, have uh, amnesty provisions, uh, and I think it is important to keep in mind that if even if someone has uh, a weapon that we are not banning today that they wish to return, they can do so, and an amnesty applies. We do want to encourage uh, the users of, of guns that they have no use for anymore, even if they can't determine its origin or hold it, and even if they don't hold a licence. We encourage them to bring into them into the police. We just ask that they contact the police before doing so. So people who illegally hold um, or can be assess a has on the um, category A gun license. Amnesty applies. We just want the guns back. Mm. So you're concerned that about the, um, yep. the reorganisation of the police firearms and licensing regime. Is that in place now? Is that still going ahead? It's not in place at the moment, but uh, there was already work underway before this came into place to drive efficiency into the system. Um, but that has not, it's not operational yet. And I think that, just to be clear, the efficiency is around the administration. Mm. Vetting is still very much face-to-face. Uh, -face. So Absolutely. Those, um, the of no, no decision had been made around the disestablishment of anything at all, of any positions at all. Well, well, no decision had been made, and as the Prime Minister alluded to, this was about the administration mm. of the Arms Act. It wasn't about the vetting or anything to do with the licensing. Mm. Has, has a decision now been made around that? Again, again, just to be clear, these are very distinct things. It's about the way that the police organise the admin of licensing. Mm. Um, they've looked to try and build some efficiencies in, and the way they administer the licensing, it hasn't changed the process of vetting, mm. the face-to-face -face contact with licence holders. Uh, we are going to go through a second tranche of reforms where we'll be looking more widely at the Arms Act. I imagine the police will want to look at some of those changes in parallel to any um, uh, administrative changes that they are making at their level. Do you expect the changes to have wide support in the House? Yes, I do. Uh, look, it's not for me to determine that. Uh, we have briefed, uh, we have briefed the opposition, um, but ultimately it's for them to determine their position. But our hope is that we will have consensus in the house. When you talked to the opposition, was there a perspective that they were? On board with it? Oh, look, certainly um, what I gleaned from the conversation uh, certainly seemed supportive, but again, it's not for me to determine their position or stance. I'm sure they'd welcome uh, being asked. Can I ask the Minister, can I ask the Minister whether it's still the police's intention to disestablish 400 
uh, um, officers and their staff by August. Barry, that was never the police's intention. They were out consulting around changes to the administration of the Arms Act. As the Prime Minister has alluded to, this was nothing to do with the vetting. This was nothing to do with anything that would have made it easier to get a licence in any way, shape or form. The, as the Prime Minister again has said, mm. there were still going to be face-to-face -face interviews, there were still going to be arms officers checking security uh, in, in licence holders' places. So um, no, nothing has been sorted. It was out to consultation. And as far as I'm aware, no, as far as I do know, that consultation has not been completed yet. But this was about, as the, again the Prime Minister has said, driving efficiency in the administration of the Act. Very essentially, essentially what we were being advised is that not everyone was necessarily mm. uh, engaged full time in the processing and administration. So the police were just looking to build more efficiency in the system. Mm. Um, very much a matter for them, though, obviously. Prime Minister, some of our reporters, yeah. some of our reporters are just texting me saying they're still able to buy extended magazines online through Gun City. Should that have stopped by now? Oh, look, of course, those are things that we are um, banning, uh, but uh, what we're able to do with the Order and Council is cover off those uh, weapons that people are able to procure in which mm. to uh, add on uh, some of these supplementary accessories. So that's the focus of the Order and Council. Uh, we are, as I understand, police are now in direct contact with mm. dealers advising them of these changes. Be a bit of time. Well, we're obviously trying to move as quickly mm. as we can. That's why an Order and Council moved in in three. That did focus on the weapons themselves, the ban will be part of the legislative uh, process uh, for all of the accessories. Uh, I'd need to check exactly um, with police. Again, we're focused on the weapons and the, with the order and council because that's what we're able to do. Um, accessories we're having to ban through legislation. But, but Uh, of course, varying prices um, across a range of these weapons. So I haven't got a precise number. I'm sure that the uh, that the officials have had to use some estimates. But again, we're very much in the dark as to how many of these are in circulation. Have you had any sort of briefing on the licensing application of the alleged government? Have we had any? So. Have you had any briefing about his, his licensing? Uh, that I'm not really in a position to share that kind of information at this point. That very is much, um, very much is for the police, and I imagine they consider that um, part of the investigation. So I'll, I'll leave questions like that for them. Would it be concerning if police did not visit his home before granting him that application? I understand that he had a um, legal uh, license, but again, any more detailed questions, I wouldn't want to expand on. Those are matters for the police. Can I, can I just say one thing with regard to a uh, question over here? Uh, you saying that reporters can buy these extended magazines. As the Prime Minister has alluded to, these are going to be illegal in three weeks' time. Mm. So don't waste your money. Mm. Just to clarify, what is happening to that declassification in this interim period? Are police going to approve, uh, still approve people who apply for that? If I applied one tomorrow, would, I, would that be OK? Is so, of course, you need to make an application uh, that would then sit with the police. And I can assure you that that would be a fairly pointless exercise. It's, just, it's, it's more of a fact that it would take people too long to get it, and by the time they got it, it would be too late, rather than any that substantial change. Yeah, again, uh, obviously it's an application process, and we will be banning these in law in three weeks' time. So it, there is essentially no point in applying. You can imagine that the police might have other priorities in that three-week period than processing such applications. Would you be to the police to say maybe hold off on granting Again, I think I can say with absolute assurity it is absolutely pointless for anyone to apply. Prime Minister, um, you talk about the seven tranches. Yeah. Any chance that those reforms will look to extend to um, air rifles that you don't require a licence for, such as like like guns? Uh, look, people may well uh, in their submissions raise uh, any issue that they choose over the period of gun reform. Uh, as I've said, though, our focus really is around issues of licensing, um, registration, uh, a number of issues that were brought up in, for instance, the 2017 inquiry. I don't believe that was, that was one of them, but people will be free to share their views. Just on the buyback scheme, obviously Australia and places like Prince Philip have had this in place before. Will you be seeking international advice yes. from others that have done this to help you guys through it? We already have. What was their advice? 
oh, well, obviously we've incorporated some of the thinking into the way that we're arranging uh, uh, some of what we're doing, keeping in mind slightly different set of circumstances in the 1990s. We've got a number of more electronic means of operating than they would have um, then. Uh, but we are, we are taking some advice, particularly around things like when you have a buyback running alongside an amnesty, how you give really clear direction across the country over what's in and what's out. In Australia, mm. in Australia, the buyback was financed by, by Medicare. Yes. Is there any thought through using a similar levy? You're, you're right, it was. Um, we haven't had specific conversations over uh, uh, precisely where the funding for the buyback will come from. Obviously, that's something the Minister of Finance is working uh, with Treasury on. We will have more detail at the time that we have the draft legislation available. It's likely we'll be able to share that thinking. So who bought their guns? But it's a set. Who bought their guns between 15th and the 3 p.m. today? You mean? Um, and, and people who voluntarily surrendered their guns. Uh, uh, oh, already? Mm -hmm. uh, it, it will be from the. It will be from essentially today. Those who have voluntarily surrendered their guns have done so under the amnesty, not the buyback. Well, Minister, uh, a senior police officer has uh, suggested to me that a ban like this uh, can, and it has in the past seen a whole lot of guns disappearing from the radar, uh, going, going underground, so to speak, on the black market. These guns already uh, aren't on the radar, Barry. So you're not concerned that people who do possess these guns Will simply, the guns will drop. Of course, we, were, we of course need to be mindful of guns that are not legal in New Zealand. We're of course already mindful of that. The issue we have is at the moment these guns, uh, which have uh, the power uh, to kill en masse, are able to be legally purchased or very easily modified in order to be uh, used, as we saw on Friday. Our focus is removing uh, that ability, and I can tell you the police are hugely supportive of those efforts. Are you confident that police follow good procedure when granting village government his licence? Uh, again, uh, that is uh, not something I am going to go into while there is a live investigation underway, uh, that is not to say that the process wasn't followed. It's simply that I'm not in a position to talk about the detail of an investigation. Is there any concern that given the, the legislation is going through Parliament so quickly that some people won't be able to give their say on it or have their submission or the public won't be adequately consulted? I think we as a government feel absolutely confident that the vast majority of New Zealanders will support this change. I feel incredibly confident of that. Essentially, someone with an E category is already able to hold those weapons. That's very much temporary. Of course, that person who may then be in possession of it as a for sale or a gift would still have to hand it back in. So technically, all we're doing is covering in the Q&A all of the legal possibilities that someone may engage in. I wouldn't particularly advise it. It just means double handling. It'll have to come into the police eventually. But in order to do that, they still need a, a permit to procure from the New Zealand police anyway. Yeah. So again, yeah. it's just us covering off every single option that may occur. I consider it unlikely. Likely. There was a bit of chat from the NRA about New Zealand changing its government. What's your message to that That, uh, in our minds, this change will have the vast majority of support from New Zealanders, and I include New Zealanders who hold gun licences. In fact, I've had people unprompted tell me that they uh, own guns, they use them for legitimate purposes, uh, members of our rural communities, and they support what we're doing. I just want to address. I want to address that, if I may. I've seen reports that uh, that we have somehow changed substantively the process for applying for gun licences in New Zealand. Uh, I consider it an insult and offensive to suggest that we, at any point, have diluted our gun laws. The changes that were made came at the request of the New Zealand Police, and there is, of course. Not for a moment anyone in the police who would seek to dilute our gun laws. They requested simply the ability to add uh, an online process for the processing of applications at the administration of the law. It did not change the substantive process of vetting and face-to-face -face interviews.
Any other questions? Uh, no, I don't believe that we do. It's, it's part of the problem. When the Prime Minister has given a figure for the buyback, the reason why there's such a wide gap and the reason we've got a problem is we just have no idea. You've got an indicative set of numbers in your mm -hmm. Q&A around um, MSSA, so... Mm. No. The issue of registration, more broadly speaking, I would categorise as one of the issues we're looking at. I really am seeking that advice from police. What will make the biggest difference to you? Um, and giving them ample opportunity to give us advice on issues of registration. Absolutely acknowledging that is something that is raised time and time again as being absent from New Zealand. But I do want to just take advice from the experts who are dealing with these issues every single day. All right. Thank you, everyone. Right, so you're watching live pictures there coming to us from Wellington, New Zealand, a press conference by the Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern and Stuart Nash, the Minister of Police. Uh, as expected, they're talking about a change to New Zealand's gun law. She said uh, the mosque attacks last Friday demonstrated the weakness of New Zealand's gun law. She said there were repeated attempts to reform New Zealand's gun laws, but all of those failed in the past. The big issue um, following the attacks is the availability of military-style semi-automatic and automatic rifles with 30-round magazines. She said the guns used in the attack had been modified in terms of their rapidity and of their magazine capabilities. And so she said, with immediate effect, New Zealand will ban all military-style rifles, automatic and semi-automatic. They'll ban all assault rifles and they'll ban all high-capacity magazines. And there'll also be a, a, a ban on parts for modification. And this will now go to discussions with the hope of passing the legislation before the middle of April. And she said they're working through legalised exemptions, which will be tightly regulated.